Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 14. Ready, Mama? Time to go! Almost, Aubrey. Grace put the fishing touches on her potato salad, sprinkled paprika on on it to give it zest and color. Aubrey had been asking her the same question since 7.30 that morning. Grace decided the only reason she hadn't run out of patience with her daughter was because she felt as anxious and eager as a two-year-old herself. Ma, ma! At the deep frustration in Aubrey's voice, Grace had to swallow a chuckle. Let me see. Grace stuck the clear wrap tidily around the bowl before she turned and studied her little girl. You look pretty. I have a bow. In a, pur in a purely female gesture, Aubrey lifted a hand and patted the ribbon grape. Ribbon Grace had threaded through her curls. A pink bow. Pink! With a smile, Aubrey beamed up at her mother. Pretty mama. Thanks, baby. She hoped Ethan thought so. How would he look at her? She wondered. How should they behave? They would be so many people there. No one. Well, besides the Quins, no, no one knew they were in love. In love. She thought with a long, dreamy sigh. Such a marvelous place to be. She blinked my little arms wrapped around her legs and squeezed. Mama! Ready! Laughing, Grace hauled her up for a big hug and kiss. All right, let's go. No general in the hour, no general in the hours before a decisive battle ever ordered his troops into action with more authority and determination than Anna Spinelli Quinn. Seth, you set those folding chairs up under the shade trees over there. Isn't Phil back with the extra ice yet? He's been gone 20 minutes. Cam, you and Ethan are putting things, those picnic tables too close together. Minutes ago, Cam said, they were too far apart. But he walked, but he walked backward holding the table another foot. That's good. That's fine. Armed with bright red, white, and blue striped cloths, and a hurried across the line. Now, you can move the umbrella tables near the water. I think Kim narrows his eyes. You said you wanted them over by the trees. I changed my mind. She scanned the yard as she spread the tablecloths. Can't open his mouth to protest, but <laughs> caught Ethan's warning shake of the head in, the head in time. His brother was right. He decided arguing wasn't going to change a thing. And it had been on a tear all morning, and when he said as much to Ethan as they moved out of earshot, I was with the irritation of the baffled. <laughs> We're talking about a practical-minded, organized woman here, Cam added. I don't know what's gotten into her. It's just a damn picnic. I guess women get that way over things like this, was Ethan's opinion. Remember the way Grace had refused to let him take a shower in his own bathroom? Just because Cam and Anna were coming home. Who knew what went on in a female mind? She wasn't this bad over the wedding reception. I expect she had her mind on other things then. Yeah, Cam yeah, grunted as he picked up one of the round umbrella tables again and began to cart it toward the sun dazzled water. Phil's the smart one. He got the hell out of the house. He's always had a knack for it. He's in a green. He didn't mind moving tables or setting up chairs or any of the dozen of chores, small or large, that Anna came up with. It helped keep his mind off with it. weightier matters. If let him himself think too much, he'd start to get a picture of Gloria DeLotner in his head, because he'd never seen her. The image his, his brain conjured up was a tall, fleshy woman with tangled, straw-colored hair, hard eyes smeared with sooty makeup, a mouth lax from too many tip trips to the bottle, too many mattings with the needle. The eyes were blue, like his own, the mouth, despite its slick coat of lipstick shaped like his own, and he knew it wasn't Seth's mother's face he was seeing, it was his own mother's. Pictures wasn't dim and fuzzy as it had become over time. It was sharp and clear as yesterday. So the power to ice his blood, to cherish a sick animal fear in his stomach that was kin to shame. So made him want to strike out with bruised and bloody fists. He turned slowly as he had to he heard the squeal of joy and saw Aubrey racing over the lawn, her eyes bright as sunbeams, and saw Grace standing by the porch wing steps, her smile warm and just a little shy. You got no right, the nasty little voice in his head is. No right to touch something so fine and bright. But oh, he had a need, one that swamped him like a storm surge and left him floundering. When Aubrey launched herself at him, his arms reached down, swung her up and around as she shrieked in delight. He wanted her to be his, with a bone deep longing. He wanted this perfect, this little, innocent, this laughing child to belong to him. Grace's knees wobbled as she walked to him. The picture they made flashing into her mind, into her heart, where she knew it would imprint itself. The lanky man with big hands and a serious smile, and the golden bright child with a pink bow in her hair. The sun poured over them as full and rich as the love that poured from her heart. 
She's been ready to come over since she opened her eyes this morning. Grace, we can eyes that we could come a little early. I'd give Anna a hand. Who's watching her so intently, so quietly. Her nerves is a wrap dance under her skin. There's not much left to do, but she broke off because his arm had snaked out, wrapped around her fast, and hard to pull against him. She had time to draw in one startled breath before his mouth came down on her rough and needy. It shot bolts of heat into her blood, sent her startled brain into a dizzy spell. Dimly, she heard Aubrey's happy squeal. Kissing Mama! Oh, yes, Grace thought, sprinting to catch up to this frantic pace. He said, Please kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. She thought she heard some sound from him. Side, perhaps. It came from some place too deep inside to make a sound. His lips softened. The hand that had clenched the back of her shirt like a man gripping his own life open stroke this gentler sweeter emotion that shimmied from him was no calmer than the first whip of greed it only glittered the edges of the yearning heat stirred she could smell him heat and man she could smell her daughter powder and child her arms circled them both instinctively making them a unit holding them holding there when the kiss ended and she could press her face into his shoulder he never kissed her in front of anyone. She knew Cam had only been a few feet away when Ethan had taken hold of her. And Seth would have seen. And Anna, what did it mean? Kiss me, Aubrey demanded, patting her head, hand against Ethan's cheek and puckering up. He obliged her to nuzzle at her neck where it would tickle and make her laugh. Then he turned his head and brushed his lips over Grace's hair. I didn't mean to grab you like that. <laughs> I was hoping you did, she muttered. It made me feel... It made me feel you've been thinking about me, wanting me. I've been thinking about you, Grace. I've been wanting you. Because Aubrey was wiggling, he set her down and let her run off towards Seth and the dogs. I oh, mean, I didn't mean to be rough with you. You weren't. I'm not fragile, Ethan. Yes, you are. When he saw Aubrey falling foolish so they could wrestle on the grass, he looked back at Grace in her eyes. Delicate, he said softly, like the white china with, with pink roses we only use on Thanksgiving. Made her heart flutter pleasantly that he would think so, even if she didn't even Ethan. Oh, I was always afraid I'd pick it up wrong, break it in half from being clumsy. I never really got used to it. He skimmed her some lightly across her cheekbone, where the skin was warm and soft and silky. Then he dropped his hand to his eyes. We'd better pitch in before Anna drives Cam over the edge. Grace's stomach continued to flutter with nervous delight, even when... She went about the chore of carting food from the kitchen out to the picnic table. She would catch herself stopping, a bowl or platter in her hand, to watch Ethan drive the horseshoe stakes in the ground. Look how his muscles rippled under his shirt. He's so strong. Look at the way he shows Seth how to hold the hammer. He's so patient. He's wearing the jeans I watched just the other day. The cups had gone white, and they'd started to fray. They were 63 cents in the right front pocket. There were 63 cents in the right front pocket. See how Aubrey climbs up on his back. She knows he'll be welcome. Yes, he reaches back, gives her a little hitch to secure her there. Then goes back to work. Doesn't mind when she steals his cap and tries to put it on her own head. His hair's gotten long and the ends glint in the sun when he shakes it back out of his eyes. Hope he keeps forgetting to go to that barber for a while yet. Wish I could touch it right now. Makes those thick sun bleach ends curl around my finger. It's a nice picture, Anna murmured from behind her. May Grace jolt? <laughs> with a quiet laugh, Anna set down the enormous bowl pasta sign. I do the same thing with Cam sometimes. Just stand and watch him. The Quins are very watchable men. <laughs> I think I'm just gonna take a quick glance that I can't stop looking. She grinned when Ethan rose. I'll be so clinging to his back. Turn to slow circles as if trying to find her. He has a wonderful natural way with children, Anna commented. He'll make a wonderful father. Grace felt heat rise up into her cheeks. She'd been thinking the same thing. It was hard to believe that only a few weeks before she told her own mother she would never marry again. Now she's thinking and wondering and waiting. It had been easy to put all thoughts of marriage aside when she hadn't believed she could ever have a life with ease and she made a poor job of marriage before because her heart had belonged to someone other than her husband. That was her fault. She accepted the responsibility for the failure. But she could make a marriage shine with Ethan, couldn't she? They could build a home and a family and a future based on love and trust and honesty. He wouldn't move quickly, she mused. It wasn't his way, but he loved her. She understood Ethan well enough to know that marriage would be the next step. She was already poised to take it. The smell of burgers smoking on the grill, the yeasty tang of beer pumped from a cold keg, the sounds of children laughing and adult voices lifted in bright conversation or lowered in juicy gossip 
the low roar of a boat zipping out over the water, with the thrill shouts of its teenager occupants, the metallic clang of horseshoe striking home. There were scents and sounds and sights. There was the snappy red, white, and blue of the cloths covering the tables that were crowded with bowls and plates and platters and casserole. Mrs. Cutter's cherry par, the Wilson shrimp salad, was left of the bristle of corn the Crawfords had brought along, jello, molds, and fruit salad, freight, fried chicken, and earlier vine tomatoes. People were spread out and gathered on chairs or on the lawn, down at the dock or on the porch. Several men stood with hands on hips, watching the horseshoe match, their faces somber, and the way men have had when they kibbalize a sporting event. Babies nagging in carriers or willing arms, while others wailed for attention. The young splashed and swam in the cold water, and the old fainted, fanned themselves in the shade. The sky was clear, the heat immense, grace watchful as noising along the ground in search of a drop of food. He found plenty, and she imagined he'd be sick as well. The dog, before the day was over, she hoped it was never over. She waded into the water, gripping Aubrey firmly, despite the colorful floaties, floats wrapped around her arms. She dipped her daughter down, laughing when Aubrey's little legs began to kick with delight. In, 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 Aubrey demanded. Honey, I didn't bring my bathing suit. But she eased out a little more until the water lapped at her knees so she could let Aubrey splash. Grace, Grace, watch this. Obliging Grace squinted against the sun and watched Seth take a run and leap off the dock, tucking knees, wrapping arms, and hitting the water like a bomb so that it shot up, shot it up in a glittering fountain and all over. Cannonball, he announced proudly when he surfaced. Then he grinned. <laughs> I got y'all wet. Seth, take me! Straining, Aubrey held out her arms. Take me! Can I? have got bombs to blow. When he swam off to join the other boys, Aubrey began to sniffle. He'll come back and play later, Grace assured her. Now! Soon, to ward what Grace knew could turn into a fine temper, she tossed Aubrey up, catching her as she hit the water. She let her paddle and splash and let her go, biting her lip as Aubrey re revealed in the freedom. Swimming, Mama. I see that, baby. You're a good swimmer, but you stay close. As Grace suspected, the sun of water and excitement combined to tire the child out. When Aubrey blinked and widened her eyes, as she did when she fought asleep, Grace threw in. Let's get a drink, Aubrey. Swimming. We'll swim. Swimming. We'll swim some more. I'm thirsty. Grace lifted her brace for the minor battle that was bound to happen. What you got there, Grace? A mermaid. Mother and daughter looked up onto the wet slope and saw Ethan. She sure was pretty. He said, smiling at Aubrey's mutinous face. Can I have her? I don't know. Maybe. She leaned close to Aubrey. He thinks you're a mermaid. Aubrey's lip trembled, but she nearly forgot what she wanted to try. Like Ariel? Yes, like Ariel. In the movie. She started to climb out. Then Ethan's hand was there, clasping her firmly. And when she gained her balance, she plucked Aubrey out of her arms. Swim in, she told him rather pitifully, then buried her face in the cover of his I saw you swimming. She was cool and wet and curled against him. He reached out to Grace's hand again and pulled her to level ground. This time his fingers twined with hers and held. Looks like I've got two mermaids now. She's tired, Grace said quietly. It makes her cross sometimes. She's wet. She had to start to take off from him. She's fine. He released her hand only because he wanted to skim his over. Grace is damp and shiny here. You're wet too. Then he slipped an arm around short. Let's walk in the sun for a while. All right. Maybe around the front of the house. He suggested smiling a little as Aubrey's breath fluttered against his skin, even it out in his sleep. Well, where there aren't so many people. With surprise and low surge of pleasure, Carol Monroe watched Ethan take her daughter and granddaughter walking. With a woman's eye, she saw more than a neighbor and friend strolling with a neighbor in front. Impulsively, she tugged on her husband's arm, distracted him from his absorption in the current round of horseshoes. Hold on, Carol. Juno and I are playing the winners of this round. Look, Pete. Look at that. Grace is with Ethan. Regularly annoyed, he flicked a glance around and shrugged. So what? With him, Pete? You not head? <laughs> it was said with exasperation and affection. Like a boyfriend. Boyfriend. He started, started to dismiss it. Christ knew. Carol had the screwiest ideas from time to time. Like when she was all heat up to take a cruise down to the Bahamas, as if he couldn't take... Take a sail any damn time that day or night right in his own backyard. But then he caught something. The way Ethan leaned his body toward Grace, the way she tilted her head up, made Pete shift 
His feet scrawled Luke away. Boyfriend, he muttered. Didn't know how the hell he was supposed to feel about that. He didn't poke his nose in his daughter's life. He reminded him so. She already gone her own way. He scrawled hard into the sun because he remembered what it had been like to have his little girl rest her head on his shoulder the way Ivory was doing right then and there with Ethan Quinn. When they were little like that, he thought they trusted you and looked up to you and believed what you told them, even if you told them thunder was just angels clapping. When they got older, they started to tug away and to want things that didn't make a damn bit of sense, like money to live in New York City and your blessing to marry some sneaky bastard who eh, wasn't half good enough for them. They stopped thinking you were the man with the answers, and they broke your damn heart, so you had to put it back together as best you could with a lock on it so it couldn't happen again. Ethan's just what Grace needs, Carol was saying in a low voice, just in case any of the funny duddies who thought tossing a horseshoe and an iron pig was an exciting way to spend the day had sharp ears. That's a steady man, and he's got gentleness in him. He's a man she can lean on. Won't. What? She won't lean on him. She's too proud for her own good, and always has been. Carol merely sighed. If it was true, Grace had gotten even stubborn <sighs> outs of that pride room. Grace had gotten every stubborn ounce of that pride from her father. You'd never even tried to meet her halfway. Don't you start on me, Carol. I've got nothing to say. He shifted away from her, ignoring the guilt before he knew the gesture would hurt her. I want to be her. He muttered and stalked away. Philip Quinn and some of the others were gathered around the keg. Pete nodded when, with an amused snort that Philip was flirting with to borrow girl Cecilia. He couldn't blame the boy. She was built like a Playboy pinup and not afraid to show it off. It wasn't something the man stopped noticing, even if he was old enough to be her father. Want me to pull you one, Mr. Monroe? Appreciate it. Petey nodded toward the celebrants in the backyard. Got you a crowd here today, Phil. Fine spread to you. I remember how you folks threw a picnic most every summer. It's nice you're keeping up the tradition. <laughs> and I thought of it. Philip told him he and Pete a foamy beer in a tall plastic cup. Women do. More to men, I suppose. If I didn't, if I don't get the chance, you tell her I appreciate the invite. I gotta get back to the water from in an hour or so. Sit up the display. You always put on a good one. Best fireworks on the shore. Tradition, Pete said again. It was a word that mattered. Carol Moreau hadn't been the only one that noticed the way Ethan and Grayson walked off together. Speculation and sly grins started to spread over the potato salad and steamed crabs. Mother Crawford wagged her fork at her good friend Lucy Wilson. You ask me, Grace is going to have to put her foot down if she wants Ethan Quinn to come up to stuff. But with that baby's old enough for college, never seen a man move so slow. <laughs> he stopped full, Lucy said lowly. Not saying different, just saying slow. Seen them moaning out over each other since before the boy got his own work boat. Has to be nearly ten years past. Stella and I, bless her soul, had conversations over it at time of two. Lucy sighed over her fruit salad, not just because she was watching her calories. Stella knew her boys inside out. That she did. I say to her one day, Stella, your Ethan's got cow's eyes for that young Monroe girl. And she laughed. And she laughed. And said... How he had himself hard case of puppy love, but that sometimes it was the best way to start the real thing. Never could figure why Ethan didn't step forward a bit before Grace got herself taken up with that Jack Casey. Never did like that man. <laughs> he wasn't a bad sort this week. Look there, mother. Lucy said low in her voice like a conspirator. She nodded toward Ethan and Grace as they walked back around the side of the house. Hands linked, the baby sleeping on her shoulder. Nothing weak about that one. Mother <laughs> wiggled bow owls and leered at her friend. And slow can be a fine thing in bed. Can't, Lucy. Lucy, you can, mother, that it can. Officially not aware of the speculation buzzing around about a quiet walk around the house on a hot summer afternoon, Grace stopped to pour some iced tea before she half filled the first glass. Her mother was bustling over her, beaming smiles. <laughs> oh, let me hold that precious girl. Nothing so soothing as sitting with a sleeping baby. She slipped Aubrey out of Ethan's arms while she talked, voice low and quiet. It'll give me a fine excuse to sit in the shade a while and be quiet. I swear, Nancy Claymont's been talking both my ears off. You young people should be off enjoying yourself. I was going to lay her down. Grace would get her mother. But her mother just waved it off. No need, no need. I don't get nearly enough chances to hold her when she's still. Go on, finish a walk. I to get out of the sun, though. It's brutal. <laughs> it's a good idea. Eat the muses, Carol, hold it off. Cue into the sleepy armory. A little shade and a little quiet wouldn't hurt. Well, all right, but I've only got another hour or so before I have to leave. He went tucking her gently toward the trees, thinking that he could find a sheltered spot, a private spot, and kiss her again. He stopped at the berg, birds in front of her. Leave for what? 
for work. I'm alone at the pub tonight. Because you're not off. <laughs> it was. That is, it usually is, but I'm putting on some more hours. You work too many hours already. She smiled, distracted, then relieved when the shade she walked into cut the intense heat in half. It's just a few more. Shreddy was good about helping me out so I can make up what I have to pay for the car. Oh, this is nice. She closed her eyes, breathed deep of the moist cold air. Anna said you and your brothers were going to play later. I'll be sorry to miss that. Grace, I told you if money was a problem, I'd help you out. <laughs> she opened her eyes again. I don't need you to help me out, Ethan. I know how to work. Yeah, you know how. It's damn near all you do. He paced away from her. Paced back and was trying to shake off what was being. I hate you working down there. <laughs> Response different. She can feel it go hard and straight. Reverberated by Mercury. I don't want to fight with you about that again. It's a good job. <laughs> Honest work. I'm not fighting with you. I'm saying it. He stalked toward her. Certainly temper in his eyes, surprising enough that she backed up against the tree. <sighs> I've heard you say it before, she said evenly, and it doesn't change the facts. I work there, and I'm going to go on working there. <sighs> you need looking after. He scraped and rolled that he couldn't be the one to do it. I don't. Hell, she didn't. <laughs> they were already tied. Smudges on her loose. Changeable green eyes, and now she was telling him she would carry trays until two in the morning. Did you pay Dave for the car yet? Half? It was humiliating. He was good enough to give me until next month to pay him the rest. You won't pay him. That at least was something he could do. Would do, bikers. I will. She forgot about humiliation. Her chin came up. Chin came up. Sharp and fast as boy. You will not. Another time he would have persuaded. Cause you were simply done the deed on the quiet. Something was bubbling up in him. Something that had been there shimmering since he turned that morning and seen her. Wouldn't let him think. Only feel an act. With his eyes on her, he slipped a hand up over to be quiet. I'm not a child. Easy you can. I'm not thinking about you like a child. Her eyes were bright and sharp. They were heating at something that was inside him to a boil. I've stopped being able to do that, and I can't go back to it. Do what I want this time. She didn't know what. When her breath had started to back up, or her skin shiver, dimly she felt the rough bark of the tree bite into her hands. She pressed them against it. She didn't think he was talking about her, except in a few hundred dollars for a garden one. Then his other hand was on her breast. He hadn't meant to put it there, but it covered her, and his fingers began to flex and knead. Her shirt was still damp, just a little damp. He could feel her skin go hotter. Do what I want this time, he repeated. Her eyes were huge. She was falling into them, drowning in them. Her heart was pounding against his hand, as if he held it beating in his palm. His mouth crushed down on hers with a violent greed that he was... He was for once helpless to stem. He heard a shot cry muffled against his assaulting mouth, and it only thrilled him darkly. The heat swarmed from him, stunning her. His teeth nipped roughly in her lip, making her gasp, opening herself to the swift and skillful invasion of his tongue. Sensations flew too quickly to separate one from the other, but all were dark and keen and compelling. His hands were everywhere, tugging up her shirt, claiming her breast, scraping those delicious rough palms over her. She felt him quiver, gripped his shoulders to balance them both. She gripped. Then he was shanking out her shorts. No, part of her mind drew back in shock. All but screamed it. Couldn't mean to take her here like this. Only yards away from where people sat and children played. Another part of her simply moaned in shocked excitement and whispered, Yes, here, now, like this, exactly like this. When he drove into her, her scream would have carried some of both, but it was swallowed by his mouth, lost in his ragged breast. He thrust hard, fast, deep, his body surging into hers, his hands biting into her th tight, round bottom. As he plunged, his mind was whipped clean of everything but this one desperate need. When she came, exploding over him, around him, in him, his thrill was dark and primal, coated. His skin was sweat, his own climax had claws, hot-tipped, razor-sharp, that ripped through him brutally, so that his vision went red. Even when it cleared, he continued to shudder, to pant. Gradually, he became aware of what was. He heard the wild drumming of a woodpecker deeper in the woods, the tickle of laughter from behind, the, beyond the trees, and graced his sobbing breast. He felt the breeze cooling his skin, and he trembled, and he trem and her trembled. Oh, my oh God, God damn it! His curse was quite ambitious. Ethan, she hadn't known 
would never have believed anyone had such a need inside him for her eat it. She said again and would have lifted her weak arms around him if he hadn't snapped back. I'm sorry, I... There weren't words. Nothing he could say would write what would be enough. He bent, slipped her shorts back up, fastened them with the same deliberate carry strain of shirt. I can't offer you an excuse for that. There isn't any. I don't want an excuse. I don't ever need one for what we do together, Ethan. Stared at the ground. Well, sick pump. Found him again. He said, I didn't give you a choice. <laughs> he knew what it was. Not to have a choice. I've already made my choice. I love you. He looked at her then. Everything that lived inside of him swirled into his eyes. Her mouth was swollen where he grabbed. She stared. Her eyes were enormous. Her body would carry bruises, bruises from his hands. You deserve her better. <laughs> I like to think I deserve you. You made me feel desired. That's not even the word. She pressed the hand to her still beating heart. Craved. She realized craved. And now I'm sorry. Her gaze flicked away from his. I'm sorry for any woman who's never known what it is to be craved. <laughs> I scared you. For a minute, mortified, she blew out of breath. Damn it, Ethan, do I have to tell you that I liked it? I felt helpless and overpowered, and it was so exciting. You lost control, and you have this incredible, unshakable control most of the time. I like knowing that something I did, something I ham snapped it. He pulled his hands through there. You confused me, Grace. I don't mean to, but I don't think that's such a bad thing either. He <laughs> let out a sigh. Set forward just enough that he could smooth her tousled hair and blue. Maybe the trouble is, we've been thinking we know each other so well, but we don't have all the pieces. Picked up her hand, studied it with the thoughtful frown she loved, and kissed her fingers in a way that made her lashes flutter. I don't ever want to hurt you in any way. But he had, and he would. He kept his hand in hers as he walked her back toward the sunlight. He would have to tell her about those pieces of himself soon so she would understand why he couldn't give her more. End of chapter 14.